Imagine if each morning when you wake up, you're smiling and looking forward to your day, knowing you are happy even while you're dealing with grief and loss. The Grief and Happiness Podcast inspires, comforts, and supports you with each new episode. I'm Emily Zerothret, welcoming you to explore with me your life of endless possibilities. Aloha. I'm so happy that you came today to listen to this podcast because you're really going to enjoy it. Uh, my good friend, Reverend Rachel Hollander, who also is the president of the Grief and Happiness Alliance Nonprofit Organization Board, is our guest. And she was my guest once before. I usually don't do guests the second time, but we were talking about the subject of today's podcast. And I said, that's really something because I've been doing a few podcasts this year on different holidays and and dealing with things related to the death of a loved one related to a holiday and she had she was telling me what she was doing right then not to be on the podcast but I said oh that's a podcast so (laughs) (laughs) so I invited her and here she is so could you introduce yourself to us please sure hi I'm Reverend Rachel Hollander I live in Cleveland Ohio Uh, Emily and I have been connected for several years through the Grief and Happiness Alliance, and she also wrote a beautiful testimonial on the back of my book that was published a couple of years ago. And she's just been very supportive, and I am equally supportive of her. So yeah, and I'm sorry, I'm an interfaith, interspiritual, ordained interfaith, interspiritual minister, and a teacher, and a performer, and I do all kinds of things. So yes, yes, thank you. So, yeah, and, and, and part of that, um, well, it's kind of interfaith, I guess, that, that you have a, a Jewish family history that, that you yes. fully participate in. And I, I just think it's cool how people can weave different family traditions and, and cultures and religions and everything and, and just make it all turn out right. It's, it's really, really good. Yeah, I always I oh, I always joke that like culturally I'm Jewish, and because I was born and raised Jewish, it doesn't matter what I am. Once a Jew, always a Jew. So, as I'm I'm an ordained interfaith interspiritual minister who is also Jewish. Yeah, <laughs> that's so cool. I I really love that, and and I also need to share with everybody that. I, I've mentioned several times about how I'm a big theater person and used to have my own live theater and I I just love theater. Well, Rachel loves theater too and she's a, a marvelous singer and she interprets ASL, American Sign Language, for theater so that people can, that who wouldn't have been able to enjoy the theater in another way can enjoy it when Rachel comes along. So I think that's such a beautiful gift. Okay, today we're going to talk about Rachel's dad in a very special tradition celebration of him that that they just have been doing. So Rachel, take it away. So yes, I was I was born into a musical family, a musical theater family. My father was a singer in temple and in the public eye. His mother was an opera singer. My mother's mother was a vaudeville performer. And so it was integrated into our family that we were performers, we were singers, and and that that singing was a gift. So even when I was as young as four with my three older sisters, my dad would put us in matching outfits, outfits and take us to the nursing homes and we would sing for people. Um, because singing was what brought joy to the world. And so he was what he was at our temple, what we call a cantorial soloist. So he wasn't the cantor, but he was brought in to do special uh, soloist work. So yeah, so theater, music, all of that was part of our family. And that was interwoven inextricably with our Judaism, that, that it wasn't just performing. It was also culturally who we were. It's beautiful. And serving, it's serving people. I I love going to the nursing homes to do that because they're off forgotten people. And that's so beautiful to go in and and do that with them. Yeah. 
Yeah, he loved doing that. <laughs> so that was, the, and now I do it. Um, I have friends who will call me and say, you know, will you come sing to my grandma or my mom, you know, and I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> anytime, anytime you want me. So I wish my dad had gotten to see me uh, become a theatrical interpreter because he would have loved this. He would have loved to have watched theater come through my hands the way it does. However, and this is kind of what we're talking about today, uh, my father left this planet quickly and dramatically uh, 48 years ago. He uh, was playing tennis and his heart was not capable of taking that game. And we didn't realize how dangerous it was. Apparently the doctor had told him not to play tennis, but I, I, I have my dad's stubborn streak, so I understand why he went and played anyway. So yeah, September 17th, 1975, um, shockingly, he left us. And it was 48 hours after he had finished singing Yom Kippur services. And Yom Kippur is the most holy of all Jewish holidays. It's the time of year when we, for lack of a better word, confess our missed marks, our sins, are moments where we might have harmed another and we fast and we pray and the prayers are all deeply passionate and personal because different from other religions where you confess what you've done wrong and God forgives you in Jewish culture and with Yom Kippur your task is you can say to God I'm really sorry I did that God's response is great go tell the person you hurt that you did that. Go get an go apologize to them. Go get their forgiveness. And uh, I used to joke that on Yom Kippur, I should stand out on the highway with a big sign that says, I'm really sorry I yelled at you because <laughs> I, I sin the most in my car. <laughs> but so these prayers are so beautiful. And so Yom Kippur of 1975, my dad was singing literally singing his heart out, these passionate, beautiful prayers. And he was fasting and he kept complaining about how dizzy he was. And we all thought, well, he's fasting. And so he sang all of the prayers. However, the Kol Nidre is, is one of the biggest, deepest, most passionate prayers of literally cleansing the soul. And 48 hours, he was gone. He was just gone. And Thank God my mom had the foresight to record that service. So we have those recordings. And so every year on Yom Kippur, I don't go to services at temple. I can stay home and have Yom Kippur services with my dad on our own. And I get to just listen to him singing 48 years ago in my ear, which is just beautiful. And it, you know, it, it is a holy time and it is a deep time. And for me, it's a very, and for my mom and also my sisters, it's a very personal time. Very personal. That's so beautiful. I, I was just thinking, as you said that, my anniversary with Jacques, my husband Jacques was 4884. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that was always a special time for me. Yeah. Oh, wow. And next year will be. 24. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, it's these epic years, these epic landmarks this year, yesterday <laughs> was the 17th and, and it, Mar my dad died at age 48 and it has been 48 years. And there's like this strange sort of closure loop around that where now he becomes history. Like he, he, that's as long as he was here. <laughs> yeah. And now it's past that. And um, somebody said something really profound to me the other day about that. And it described it perfectly. And I can't remember what they said, but it was so perfect. But it's that idea where like, it feels like the loop has closed. And now we move into a new era of him being gone. Um, but he's really, he's the reason why even as I studied other religions, and even as I experimented and wanted to step into them and find out, you know, am I Buddhist? Am I a Hindu? 
Do I want to, you know, delve into Islam? I do. I want to delve into all of them. And because of what gifts he left with me and in me, I will always claim my Jewish heritage as who I am. That's Proudly. Just beautiful. I, I really love that. And we have a very special treat for the listeners today that, as Rev. Rachel said, that her mom recorded that last time, 48 hours before he died, of uh, singing this beautiful uh, part of their Yom Kippur service. So we're going to play it for you now so you can listen to it and hear what she's talking about. back. I know you enjoyed that. It was so powerful to me when I listened to it for the first time. And it's, he's got such a, a lovely voice, just a, a beautiful voice. He just, I, I had no idea what he was saying, but I felt comforted by whatever it was. It just, <laughs> it felt good to listen. It does. It just, you know, and even I, like there are times when I remember the translation and then there are times when I'm like, yeah, I can't remember what that means. But I do know that he was singing from the purest part of his soul. And you can hear it. It's so passionate. It's just, yeah, yeah. I'm grateful for his gift to me. That's so beautiful. And it, it's so nice to talk about somebody who who you love so deeply and who's been gone for a while. How old were you when, when he died? I was 12. Wow. I was 12. And... Um, Here's a really cool story. This is how we joke about my dad messing with technology. So it was September of 75. I was 12 and my oldest sister, there are three sisters. My oldest sister was 21 and we had been planning to have a dual bat mitzvah because she had never had hers. And so we'd been planning this with my dad. It was going to be in January of 1976 and he was going to be the cantor for us. And we had the whole service mapped out. And then in September, he was gone. And we thought, should we do it? Like, how will we do it? And what will that be like? And so we decided to go ahead. And we had, you know, at that time, there, were, you know, technology was pretty minimal in 76. <laughs> so we had a few people, like a couple people recording it on cassettes, and some people taking photographs, none of which came out. Oh, one recording was static. One recording was nothing. And none of the film and the cameras developed into any photographs. So that, that was the first time my dad intervened with technology. And we thought, wow. okay, he just wow. wanted the people who were there to witness it and be experiencing it. And that was it. Because he was a total technology nut. He loved, he would be, in fact, I credit him with the iPhone. I'm pretty sure he invented it. Because he, <laughs> he always had the first of everything, the first recorder and the first cameras and the first of all these technologies. And he would be loving today with all the things that are out there. So, yeah, yeah, that was, oh, he still it, shows up. <laughs> I'm sure that uh, he's going to be loving listening to this podcast today <laughs> when you're speaking so lovingly of him and honoring him in this way. I hope so. The other thing about him that I'm really grateful for is 
um, that when I sing now, I can feel there's a moment, and I hope people will understand this, but there's a moment when I'm really singing that I move out of the way and he begins to sing me. I feel him singing me. And I don't, I'm not nervous and I don't worry about anything and I don't think, oh, can I hit that note? Because it's him. And it's so beautiful, those moments when it's still like, I'll finish singing and I'm like, then I come back into my body and I'm like, oh, okay, thanks, Dad. I hope that was fun for you because that was great. <laughs> it's a really beautiful, yeah, it's a gift, another gift that he gives me. That's, that's so gorgeous. There's music is just such an important part of our lives. I, I know um, my husband, Jacques, was a singer. And he when he was growing up, it was a family thing. His dad and his uncle and he, the, the three guys, would get together and sing. And he played the accordion and his uncle played <laughs> the ukulele. And they sang all kinds of things. And they loved singing together. They they just had a ball doing that. And he really loved that when, when he was growing up. And he ended up, he was a lot older than I am. So he had different kinds of experiences, like he knew that he was um, going to be drafted into World War II. And so he decided that he would make the most of it and get through college and graduate in time before he uh, left. And fortunately, the war got over about the same time, but he had already made the plan. So he did go ahead and go into the Air Force, but didn't have to to be the, the part of it that he had anticipated. But while he was in college, he, he lived in Los Angeles. And back in, in those days, they had live radio shows. And he did a live radio show, a regular show, where it was just him and a pianist, and he'd sing. Oh, how lovely. And it, it was just just really gorgeous. And I found something when we were going through his things after he died, before his celebration of life, that I didn't know that we had. And he, I'm not sure that he even knew that it was there. But I was going through some old records, and I found a 78. And it turned out that it was a recording of him when he was singing on the radio. And, of course, I, I, yeah, it, it was amazing. And at the time, I was working at the university, and I was able to uh, talked to a guy there who was a wizard with sound and he was able to record it into in those days an mp3 file <laughs> he was able to make mm. that so that as when people entered the theater the theater that I had was where we had his absolutely amazing celebration but as people were entering he was singing to them perfect perfect it, it was it was so wonderful, and they they were all shocked. They kept saying, "God, that sounds just like Jacques." <laughs> it's like, guess what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I just know that he would be so thrilled with that because he had because he went into the military, he just stepped away from theater because he he'd done it a lot in in college, and his uh, his parents, or actually his families worked in the film industry in all different kinds of roles in the film industry. His dad was a master electrician. His mom was an executive secretary at MGM. And mm. they they did the in the, the heyday when when it was transferring from silent movies into the regular movies. They they were there and oh the stories they had were absolutely fantastic. So he was always very comfortable with performing. And he just didn't perform at all until he, after he graduated from college, until he met me. And I was a theater major in college, and one of the things I had to take was a directing class, and I had to direct a one-act play, and I said, you want to be in it? <laughs> <laughs> and he, he didn't hesitate too much, but boy, it kicked off a whole new thing for him. And from then on, he was on stage for the rest of his life singing, dancing, comedy, he loved to do comedy, and he was very good at it, and people loved him, and he loved to be Santa Claus. They, yeah. they even took pictures of him for the big mall in the, the, the big mall for the county for the Santa Claus aged it for two years in a row with all of his pictures and all their, their advertisements. Wow. So it, it was so neat that he was able to, to step into something that 
I don't think he even realized he was missing it until he got back into it. And it just brought him so much joy. Yeah. Yeah. Similarly, yes, theater was a huge part of our family's life. My dad loved to perform. My sister, my second oldest sister is a performer, actor, teacher, director, the whole shebang. Um, we all did community theater growing up. In fact, one of the times my sister Lisa was going to audition for Sound of Music and I asked my dad, I said, can I ride along? And he said, sure. And so we were driving to the audition and he said, so what are you going to sing for your audition? And I said, oh, I'm not, I'm not auditioning. And he said, it's Sound of Music. You're going to audition. And I was <laughs> like, well, I didn't, I'm not dressed for it. I didn't, you know, I was, and he said, sing, you are my sunshine. And I said, okay. So we went in and we both got cast. <laughs> We both oh, got God. cast and she was Louisa and I was Brigida. And then my family trip, like they, my dad would do these family trips to New York where he would pack us all in the car. <laughs> we would drive in on a Thursday. We would see shows on Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday afternoon, Saturday night, Sunday matinee, then stop at the store, buy all the cast albums and sheet music and drive back to Cleveland. And this was the, th and we had to learn all the songs and we, you know, we had to be ready at a moment's notice to audition or perform. And he would, this was, you know, this was his thing. <laughs> and, and he took tons of pictures of us. And uh, I mean, like I'm now all these memories are now coming up of like, I used to joke that uh, in my family, well, I used to joke with people, they would say, how do you sing harmony so well? <laughs> because when I sing with people, I just hear the harmony and I can go. And I thought everybody could do that. Oh. <laughs> And I, they were like, well, you know, how did you learn to do that? And I always joke that in my family, you either had to find your harmony or find a new family. Like it was like, it was, <laughs> you know, <laughs> learn the harmony. And um, there was this one time we were driving to Florida, all six of us in the car driving down to Florida. And all of a sudden, my dad starts doing the bass line to Blue Moon. You know, he just starts going, blue, 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 blue moon, do, 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 do. And all of us came in. Oh, wow. <laughs> In harmony, <laughs> singing Blue Moon. <laughs> was, wow. These are the things like, and I thought this was what all families did. <laughs> oh, funny. I thought all families did that. And I found out from other people that no, not all families did yeah. that. <laughs> Well, we certainly didn't do it to that extent, but it, <laughs> back in the days when, when I was a little girl, we didn't have radios in the car. And one right. of the things we did for in entertainment was to go for a ride, especially when the, the wildflowers would come out. We had to, to go for a ride so we could see all the flowers. And I learned all the names of all the flowers. And still now people say, how do you know those names of those flowers? <laughs> well, it, it was just my family. That's just what we did. But since we didn't have a radio, we'd sing. And of course, it was the same yeah, songs yeah. over and over again, because we weren't really a singing family, but we sang <laughs> You Are My Sunshine. Awesome. And the Old Rugged Cross was another <laughs> one that we always sang. And we, we it was just singing was part of, of what you did. And interestingly, yeah. with, with your, your first experience with your sister there in Sound of Music, my first experience was with my sister. And it wasn't musical, but... My sister was nine years older than I am, and she was in the community theater production of A Christmas Carol. Mm. And she was having a good time, and she really liked it. And she really liked doing things that I was far away from <laughs> with our age difference, you know. <laughs> and she came home like the the night that they were doing, or the week that they were doing tech rehearsals, and she was so upset because the the boy who was playing Tiny Tim's big brother had to, to drop out of the show for some reason. And nobody knew anybody that was the right age and right size and everything. And mother said, your sister is, she can see she's not a boy. She, she said, look at her. <laughs> you know? yeah. Put her in the third grade, you know. <laughs> and and I didn't have much hair, so it was it was just perfect. And I still remember my line from that play. It was never father, no, never. Father. 
<laughs> That's hilarious. Oh, what really got me was when I watched a, a movie of it. I think it was just this year. I, I usually, cause you've seen, I've seen so many different versions of different takes on Christmas Carol they've done. And I, I think somebody else was watching it. So I was there and here comes Tiny Tim's big brother. And he said the exact line that I had. Father. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I really did remember it right. <laughs> Well, and I will correct on um, my actual first theater performance was in Fiddler on the Roof. Mm. Um, when I was, I think I was eight. I was the youngest daughter of Bielka. And my sister Anita was Chava. So I was still in a show with a sister. So there was always a sister in a show. And one of the funniest parts of that show, my mom and dad were in the audience watching me and in the scene before Sabbath prayer, you know, everyone is getting ready for Shabbat. And little Bielka, me, was standing on stage peeling potatoes, but they hadn't taught me how to peel potatoes. So I was cutting upward. And I had a real knife, oh, no. <laughs> a real knife and a real potato. And I was literally cutting from the bottom of the potato upward. So the knife was coming in a sharp movement towards my own throat. So my parents are watching this, they're terrified. And then at one point I cut my finger. But being the consummate actor, I didn't want to disrupt the scene. So I just kind of stopped and like looked at my finger and then like held it real tight until the scene was over. And then I came off stage and I'm like bleeding. <laughs> but nobody knew except my mom. My mom was like, yeah, she cut her finger. <laughs> <laughs> So they knew. But that other than singing, we started singing, I think I was four, three or four when I started singing with my sisters. But Fiddler was the first on stage performance. I will say that my sister Celia, now that I've mentioned all of them, uh, Celia has perfect pitch. Mm -hmm. And she used to play games with friends after school where she would sit at the piano and hit a note and say, can you guess what it is? Because she could do that. But they couldn't do it. Because not many people can do that. And I remember once when we were uh, at Disney World in Florida with my, my whole family, my dad, the time we drove down, and um, there was a train whistle. And my dad looked at Celia and just like looked at her and she went, C sharp. <laughs> wow. <laughs> because I believe, and they'll correct me if I'm wrong on this, I think he had perfect pitch. I'm not sure, but he knew she did. And so he would encourage it. Like, you know, we're going to start singing. Celia, you choose the note. And it was, everybody brought their gifts, you know, to the room. And he really honored all of those. Oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah. Well, I just, I think it is so fabulous that you honor your dad the way that you do and that you've got this kind of a, a way that it's set up that you're, you're never going to forget, <laughs> yes. you know, and it, uh, it it's just beautiful. I, I would hope more people would do that sort of thing as honoring their, their loved ones because it's, it's a beautiful thing to do. It keeps them in your heart always, whether they're physically here or not, they're still with you by these wonderful memories that you have to share. I was, I was writing in my journal yesterday about it being 48 years, and I wrote down two phrases, two word phrases. The first was, it's a sweet sadness, and it's a grateful grief. Mm. And that's what it truly is. It's a very sweet sadness around him, and a grateful grief that I had 12 years that shaped me as who I am, and I get to carry that with me. So oh. lots of gratitude. So beautiful. Well, listeners, I hope you all are going to get your journals out after you listen to this <laughs> and write about your, your dad or some other loved one who is really special to you and the, the joyful memories that come back when, when you're uh, thinking of them. It's, it's yeah. just, just beautiful. So thank you so much for being my guest again, Rev. Rachel. Thank you for giving me a chance to talk about my dad. <laughs> Well, we'll be back next week with a new guest and new subject. And I'm so glad that you listened to the podcast. It, uh, there's, there's so much good that you can gain from this and support yourself in the process. So thanks for listening and I'll see you next week. 
you want more comfort, support, and happiness, join the Grief and Happiness Alliance. Visit my website at lovingandlivingyourwaythroughgrief.com and read my book, Loving and Living Your Way Through Grief. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast, rate it, review it, and binge on all our episodes on grief and happiness. I can't wait to welcome you back to another episode.